Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is the first clip in a series on creating a Lambda function. So in this series, I really want to dive into what is Lambda, why we should be using Lambda, um, and sort of how it works, and really just outline a basic application. We're going to create it all locally, we're going to test it locally, we're going to push it into Lambda, and really just sort of go through why we would do this. Really, it's really important to understand the use case behind Lambda. Um, essentially, you know, to sum it up in, <laughs> in a couple of sentences is, Managing servers sort of sucks and you know having the idea of doing management related tasks anymore is sort of in the past We're really getting to a point now where we just focus on serverless compute, right? We have this idea where we can have functions as a service You know you might hear people call it serverless or you might hear functions as a service or FAS I, I you know they're really trying to say the same thing So just go easy on them if they're saying serverless and you think they mean FAS It's all good really, you know, we're all we're all in this together and what we're trying to do is eliminate the management of things that are just unnecessary. Right? We're all going to get to a point where we just start to build functions that sort of give business value or perform some action that fits in something with something nicer that already is performing and giving business value. So it's about how we can do this at the most minimal costs. Uh, you know, how do we avoid things like management? That's really where Lambda comes in. You don't have to worry about anything like management or whatever. It's just throw your function. Uh, into Lambda and it will work out how to how to run it and everything in, in, in whatever is running in, on the back end, right? So we'll go through a little bit of the theory behind it as we move through it. But essentially what I want to go through is this simple application here. So here we have a front end user and this user is going to upload something to an S3 bucket. That S3 bucket, when that actual object arrives in that bucket, it's going to call Lambda and process that image and actually resize it. So we're working with images here. The user is essentially going to put an image into a bucket. Lambda is going to trigger, take that image, resize the image and put it into a resized images bucket that the user can then grab the image and work with it however they want, right? So you can think of this in a couple of ways, right? The user is actually performing this action to put this in the bucket, but it could simply be an application that's putting that image in the bucket and then having Lambda execute and then waiting for the image to come out of the resized bucket and then grabbing that and displaying it on the website somewhere. So this can be a completely sort of automated process that's worked in with your normal business workflow as such, um, where applications can actually put in and handle getting the application out. So for simplicity's sake here, we'll just put the item in ourselves and grab it down. But you can imagine this in a use case. Like, so say for example, I run a pet store, right? And I have images of the pets that I want to sell. Um, but I also have thumbnails of those pets, right? And I want the thumbnail to be the same as the image, but I need it to be a different size, of course. Now, I don't really want to resize all of those myself. I want to have some sort of way that when I say, hey, website, upload, and I upload a picture of a dog, I want to have that image in multiple different sizes, right? And I'm going to use it for different parts of my website displayed in different areas on the page, right? So it's really important to have this thought process ironed out. And once we fully understand that, we can start to see the business value of this straight away. You know, imagine if you had a thousand pets and you had to manually sort of resize all those images. It's going to be a complete nightmare. So what we're going to do in this series is go through this process. So we're going to create uh, this Lambda function and we're going to be doing that with Node.js, right? So I've talked a little bit about Node.js before uh, and I've had some videos up in the past, but I really want to sort of hone in on that and talk about it a little bit and go through what I would say is a good way of building a Lambda function. I'm not a massive node expert, but I've played enough around with it to understand my way around. And I think we can build a pretty solid function that will be able to do our image resizing and sort of really want to go through explaining how that function works as we go through this process. So in the series, we're going to cover things like uh, callbacks. We're going to talk about promises. Um, we're going to talk about you know, importing and exporting uh, of resources between files in, in Node. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what Node is. I really want to make this bit of a tutorial about learning about Node and in the process learning about Lambda and serverless compute. Okay, so this is what we're going to build. So how do we start this project? So what I want to do to start this project is just come into an empty directory and I'm going to call this the resizer tute, right? This is a tutorial on creating a resizer in Lambda. Now I don't have anything in here as you can see. So the first thing I actually want to do is npm in it. So npm is the node package manager. And what it's going to do when I type in init is initialize a new project for me. So it's going to talk me through some of the defaults about creating a project. So, you know, do I want the package name to be resize a tute? Sure, I don't mind. The version could be 100. I'm not going to give it a description right now. The entry point could be index.js. That's fine. It's just going to be the file that we use to actually have our entry point for our application. Test command, we don't have any tests yet. Git, keywords, author, license. So that's okay. I'm fine with just skipping through that. It's not a problem. So that's all done. And if we just look in the directory now, we can see we just have a package.json. So if we just cat that package.json, 
we can see that it has that JSON information in it that we just sort of went through in that initialization. So this is something that we're going to use to keep state of the packages that are in our project. So later on, we're gonna to need to work with things like S3, right? This is going to be part of a module that is part of the AWS SDK, right? So when we pull down that SDK, you know, I don't wanna to have to push that SDK into GitHub so people can sort of pull it down. I wanna use a package manager um, and we do that with NPM in Node.js or JavaScript. Um, so what it's gonna do in this package.json file is keep track of the modules that I'm using. And then when someone pulls this project down, all they have to do is just npm install and I'll get all of those project files and all the modules that are needed to run the application. So it's a nice place to like sort of keep state about your application and what its dependencies are and what its development dependencies are as well. So you have things like development dependencies like you know, your testing framework or any sort of um, task runner that you might use locally. That's really great for the development side of things, but you don't need that in your actual finalized production package. So this is where we're gonna be keeping all of that sort of stuff. So that's what that file is for. So the next thing we're gonna need is an index.js. So here I'm just gonna open up code because it's easier to work in Visual Studio Code rather than just doing this from the command line. So I'm gonna create a new file and I'm just gonna call it index.js. So now I have index.js and package.json, right? These are the two files that I'm going to use to start off this project. So the next thing I'm gonna do is create a folder and I'm gonna call this controllers. So I'm gonna call it controllers in a sense where I'm going to have files in here that are gonna act as certain controllers throughout my application, right? So when I start to think about controllers, I can already sort of get a sense of what we're going to need. And this is a really good idea to do if you start to build a modern piece of software, is to start thinking about it and conceptualizing it before you even start. And then so, okay, I'm going to need a controller, right? So you think about this and you go, okay, what's this actually gonna do? Well, I'm gonna to need to put stuff in S3, right? I'm gonna to need to get stuff from S3, right? Because like when I put the thing in S3 the first time, that's a user doing that, but Lambda is going to need to grab that out of S3, the, the original bucket, process it, and then put it in the resized bucket, right? So it's going to need those two different tasks are going to have to be done. So I'm going to put that into a, a S3 specific controller. And why I want to do that is so that in the index file, I can simply import that file and get access to those functions that I've created in that controller, right? So now it's just a way of encapsulating that content. So in here, I'll create something called S3JS, right? And that's just going to be in there as a placeholder for now, but we will use that later on. Okay, so I haven't even written any code yet, and this is fine because this is all I really wanted to do in the first video. It's just an introduction into what we're going to be creating, how it sort of works, and just a basic outline. Now, I wanna quickly have a chat about the module that we're going to be using, which is going to be called GM. So I just quickly wanted to chat about the module that we're going to be using throughout this series, and it's gonna be called GM. So GM is graphics magic. It's sort of a way to change the properties of images. You can do all sorts of fancy stuff. You can do overlay images where you put your Twitter handle on images. You can resize, you can format, you can shift them around, you can crop them, all that sort of stuff, right? This tool is really, really great for working with images. So you can see here under the getting started, you can see that they have a brew install command that actually lets you install image magic and graphics magic. We don't need to do that. Inside Lambda itself, it already has access to some binaries and one of them is the uh, graphics magic, image magic. So you don't really need to worry about it. That's all gonna be handled for you in Lambda. Again, you just write the code, shoot it up and it works. So what we are genuinely interested in though is the examples. It's really cool to see some of the examples about how this works, right? You can see um, here is a basic resize command, right? That's really handy. We're gonna to need to do that, right? We're gonna to need to resize our image. That's what we're doing. So what I really love about Node and NPM is that a lot of these sites, you can sort of use these examples and really just sort of bring them into your project. There's nothing wrong with just sort of taking that example and going, hmm, that's really good. I wanna use that, boom, let's do it. So that's, that's something that we probably will use. And if we have a look, you know, what we wanna think about is what's the most optimal way to create this application? Let's like think about that a bit. Like, you know, in Lambda, you do have the ability to store files in the temp directory, right? In slash TMP. So we could do that, but with that sort of, you know, when we think about Lambda and we go, okay, it's charged by the hundredth of a millisecond, right? So every hundred milliseconds you pay for that hundred milliseconds. So if your function is 102 milliseconds, you're paying for 200 milliseconds. So you need to think about, hey, if I wanna keep this really cost efficient, how can I make my Lambda function, you know, maybe not touch disk? Because if you have to write to the disk and then read from the disk, you know, it's probably going to be an extra overhead. So maybe you can store that buffer stream in memory and consume it. So you grab that buffer of content in that image and you translate it and resize it and then stream it out to the bucket, right? So something like that where it doesn't have to touch disk, that's probably going to be a lot faster um, because it's more memory intensive and you can scale your function on memory to get it more cost efficient. So just looking through the documentation right now, I can already see there's a whole section on buffers. 
And we can see here that it says a buffer can be passed instead of a file path as well, right? So that's actually really cool because I can actually buffer up some information. Like as I'm bringing it in, I can create a buffer of little bits of information that contain the information about my image, right? Uh, and then I can pass that into the resize method of GM, right? So it has a resize method. And then uh, by the looks of it, I can also say um, a buffer return as well. So a buffer can also be returned instead of a stream. So streams are really great in a sense where I want to have a stream that's constantly open, right? And I want to keep sending stuff down it. Um, but in this sense, I'm really just going to have an image. So I can store that as a buffer, right? I can create a buffer for that. I can get that information in and I can resize it and then I can ship it out as a buffer as well. So here it just says, you know, a buffer can be returned instead of a stream. The first argument to buffer is optional and specifies the image format. So right here, this piece of code is like exactly what we want to get started, right? So this documentation here is just so key and so perfect for getting started that I can just simply take that and I can dump it straight into my application. So I'm going to, of course, need to import the GM or the image magic we're actually going to be using. So I'm going to actually need to import image magic. Um, and again, you can see that from the documentation. Here you can see it says uh, GM equals require GM subclass image magic. So I actually want to use the subclass of GM. I don't want to use the whole thing. I'm just going to use image magic. That's the part of it that I want to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say const uh, GM equals and I'm going to require that package GM, right? So I'm going to get the subclass out of that image magic and that's true is how I say enable it as such. So I'm going to call this GM even though I'm just using the image magic aspect of it because I'm getting the whole GM module as such and just accessing a subclass of it. So it still makes sense. So we remember that in the documentation that it said this first image format was optional. So I'm going to remove that. I don't really like the idea of having to pass in an image format if I don't need to. Why bother? Also, for the sake of keeping things modern and clean, I want to use ES2015 syntax or ES6, you can call it. So I'm going to remove this function tag and I'm going to simply just put an arrow bracket after that. Now, what this does is exactly the same thing. It's just a function. It's just a modernized way of declaring a function. And if you're after more information on ES6 syntax as opposed to uh, you know, previous versions of ECMAScript, check out our online. There's a whole bunch of reading you can do about the different syntax between the versions. But for the sake of simplicity and keeping it clean and modern, I'm going to go with ES6 syntax. So I'm also going to indent this a little bit. This looks sort of whack. I don't really like it like that. Um, this is fine for now. We're going to keep this as a bit of a placeholder. So the next thing you might say is, what about the GM module? Have you even installed that yet? You've got a require up here, but you haven't actually installed it. Right, so I'm going to use npm and I'm going to say npm install gm. And what that's going to do is actually save it. I didn't do dash dash save, but you don't need to anymore. But if you do dash dash save, you used to have to do that. But you don't need to do that anymore. What actually happens now is if you just do an npm install on that package, it will actually save it as a dependency for you. So if we have a look at our package.json file, we can actually see that we now have this dependency in here of gm. So that means that when I commit this to version control, I don't need to push up the node modules that I just installed. I just push up the package.json. Someone will bring this down and they'll just do an npm install and they'll get all of those modules that they need to run this application. So that makes that super, super simple. So that's pretty much it for this one. I'm gonna leave this just like this for this first little bit. We're gonna change this a fair bit as we build on our application. But for now, we're going to keep this in here, just a static file name. We're gonna keep in some static resizing types, that's fine. We're gonna put that into buffer again. This is really fine just for getting started in the first clip. That's all I really wanted to show, just sort of getting the template code out, thinking about things, talking about how we're gonna do it, and moving on from there. So in the next clip, we'll dig into this further and really get into the coding part of it and really build out our functions.